difficult. All right, good morning. Good to see everybody. Good morning. Good morning. We're continuing our series in the Gospel of St. Luke. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Pray that you would help us to understand what you want to say to us for this specific day. Yes. Lord, we just give you the praise and the glory for we believe that you're going to give us your wisdom today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Amen. We're going to talk about what's called the Good Samaritan. That's a very popular saying. Even in secular culture, society, they talk about somebody helping a stranger as the Good Samaritan. And most people, of course, don't know that that came from the Bible. And in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 10, verse 25 to 27, we see that story. But instead of reading the whole story, um, I want to just share that. I believe that there are many good Samaritans, even in New York City. New York City has a reputation for being a very cold, hurried city. That has not been my experience. My experience is that every time I've needed somebody to help me, uh, and I'm talking about strangers, God sent somebody, or somebody, everybody who's always willing to help. And, uh, and so I've been the recipient of many, many uh, good deeds by people, and you can call it the favor of God, or you can say, you know, whatever. Uh, I remember one time I was trying to get my car out on 4th Avenue between uh, Senator Street and 67th Street on 4th Avenue in Bay Ridge, and it was after a snowstorm, and I was having a really hard time, so I was just shoveling uh, the car. I had no help, and, you know, it was in four feet of snow. And some guy walked by, never met him before. He happened to be an Asian guy, probably in his 40s. And he said, give me that shovel. I'm going to do this for you. I said, what do you mean? Why? No, I'm doing this for you. And the guy spent, he wouldn't even let me help him, a half hour getting my car out. Wow. And I was like blown away. And here I am, I'm the Christian. And I'm shocked that this guy is good deep. And he just, out of nowhere, came. Um, and it wasn't like I wasn't physically able to do it. It was hard. Um, but this guy did it. And I can tell you countless stories of strangers just coming out of nowhere, helping me. So that's what this is talking about, is when we happen to come across somebody who needs our help, and it gives us a criteria of what that help, when they should get the help. Uh, it tells us uh, what we should do, basically. So, so here, in this story, Luke chapter 10, verse 25, says, Behold, the lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test. And he said, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What is it written in the law? And the law is referring to the first five books of the Old Testament. And, he, and Jesus said, how do you read the law? How do you interpret it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as you love yourself. And Jesus said, you have answered correctly. So as an expert in the law, which is what a lawyer was, he was able to understand that the whole point of the law was to give us a love for God and a love for our neighbor. But this lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was, and, and this is interesting, Jesus never answers questions directly. And if he does, he does it once in a while. Like when the woman at the well said, when the Messiah comes to show us all things, and he said, I that speak to you am he. Most of the time he answers questions with another question or a story. So this time he gives a real life story. I know some people say this is a parable, meaning it didn't happen, but 
The only time something's a parable in Scripture is when it says it's a parable. Now it's possible it is a parable because it doesn't mention anyone's name, but it doesn't say this is a parable. So I'm assuming this really happened. So Jesus, in response to the question, who is my neighbor, replied a man was going down. He didn't say this is a parable. A man was going down from Jerusalem and he was going to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed on by the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he was journeying, came to where he was and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he met him on his then he set him on his own animal, which is probably a donkey, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out money and he gave it to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatsoever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three, meaning the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, he's asking the lawyer, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the one who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer answered, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Wow, what a powerful story. So he was using a real life illustration to answer the question of who is my neighbor? And it's amazing how this also shows us that God is looking at what all humans do, even those not in covenant with him. So here we're talking about a Samaritan, and Samaritans were not Jews, they were not in covenant with God. But yet God was still looking at what that Samaritan did in real life. And so we can say that as we stretch that out, God is looking what everybody does, even if they're not Christians. Mm -hmm. And so I believe the moral or the principle of the story is given to show us in the way it against our life to see if we are living a self-centered life or if we're seeking the benefit of other people. This generation is called the selfie generation for a reason. It's because when asked the question, what do you want to be when you get older? Or what is your goal? They asked this to millennials maybe 15, 20 years ago, and their goal was to be celebrity, to be famous. When they asked the same question in the 1950s, the, the answer was, we just want to be good citizens, we want to help others, we want to serve others. So you see how the values of our culture have shifted to be towards a negative bent to more self-centeredness. We even see many times in the news somebody is getting robbed or a horrific accident or something, and instead of people calling 911, they're taking selfies, uh, they're showing they were there, they're videotaping it so that they can get more uh, followers in some kind of spectacular fashion. And so we see that a lot of the values of a society uh, have shifted a lot, especially with a young generation. I'm not sure the Gen Zs are the way the millennials are, that I haven't researched. But in general, the culture is becoming self-obsessed. And, uh, and again, my testimony showed that I don't believe everybody's like that. I think that there are very nice people and there are people who are sincere, uh, generally speaking, in this world. I've seen many, many good people. And I believe that that outweighs the wickedness or the uh, wicked people in the world, not the wickedness. The wickedness is there in the culture. 
And so as we go through the story, I believe the Lord would have us ask ourselves a few questions. Who in my life is the neighbor God has called me to serve? So we have to make it practical for ourselves. Second question I think the Lord would want us to ask, how can I practically implement this story in my life? A third question, am I thinking of others in my Christian faith merely for myself or am I only thinking of myself and my family? And a fourth question, what resources, time, treasure, talents, can I utilize to demonstrate the love of God to other people? So these are questions that I believe the Lord would have us ask ourselves as we go through this story. And so let's go back again to the beginning. Behold, the lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is it written in the law? How do you read it? How do you interpret it? And he answered, Love God, love your neighbor, and as, as I love myself. Jesus said to him, You've answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. And so... What is a lawyer? It's not exactly what we would define as a lawyer today. Um, not even sure why they use the word lawyer in the translation. But a lawyer would have been an expert in the Lord God uh, and how to interpret and apply it in their context. So in that sense, it, it involves a lawyerish and judgeish kind of things. So that's probably why they use the word lawyer. Another way of saying that would be an expert in the law or a scribe. And so these are people who try to help fellow Jews understand what the law said and how they should use it in their own life. And a lot of them taught in synagogue and, and all these things. And so they spent all their time studying the law the rabbinic writings, the Torah, and other things, and writing on this. And so they had a significant role in the Jewish community related to legal issues and the social life of Jews. And so the lawyer uses his expertise to try and trick Jesus. And you see this many times in the scriptures, some of the experts in the law thought that they could ask Jesus a question or poise a situation to him that he wouldn't have an answer for. I remember the same thing happened when one of these experts said to Jesus, the law tells us that if a man's wife dies, then his brother has to marry his wife so that he doesn't lose his inheritance. And his seed continues. And they said, well, what happens if the guy had seven brothers and the wife had, became a widow of seven times. What happens in the afterlife? Whose wife is she? So they thought they were going to trick Jesus, but then he said, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know the scriptures or the power of God because in the afterlife, there's no male or female, nor marriage. And then he said, whatever, I don't want to get into the whole story, but Jesus was constantly being tempted with uh, these trick questions and every time he turned it back on them another time I can remember they said uh, should we pay taxes and Jesus said give me the coin whose picture is this this is Caesar's picture they answered well give to Caesar what Caesar's and give to God what's God's meaning you're made in God's image give yourself to Christ give yourself to God because you're made in God's image so everything they asked him he turned it around had an answer for and threw it back on them and put an obligation on them. Incredible. That's what he's doing here. And so um, we see this lawyer give him a so-called trick question. But it was a good question. It was real. And Jesus was often in conflict with these lawyers and with the Pharisees and Sadducees and religious leaders. Not because... And this is where a lot of Christians get mixed up. They think Jesus was changing the law of Moses. No. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. What Jesus was challenging was not what we read in the Bible. He was challenging the rabbinic writings 
that twisted the law with their commentaries and their explanations. And sometimes it got so legalistic, they strained the net. And it was crazy, some of the things they were teaching. So that's what Jesus was challenging. And also, an outward legalistic form of the law that didn't have a heart, didn't have the, the mercy of God at the center. And so Jesus answered him something based on the real intent of the law, which we will go to. So when Jesus said, okay, you answered correctly, do this, meaning love God first and love your neighbor, do this and you will live, who's actually quoting the law. A lot of Christians think, well, he just said this himself because he's God. Well, no, he came to fulfill the law. He gave the exact answer is based on what, the, what God's original intent was of the law. And even faults the Christians to say that Jews didn't live by faith, they lived by the law. That's not true. If you look at the Old Testament, everything was by faith. Abraham lived by faith. Moses talked about faith, about loving God from the heart. So it's the rabbinic writings that twisted things around and made it about an outward ritual. That's why I can read the book of Deuteronomy, Numbers, and Leviticus, get incredibly blessed by it, even in the New Testament, because it was by faith and it was still showing the grace of God. It was amazing. There was a continuation between the Old and New Testament. It's really one testament. The second one fulfilled that which the first one talked about. The first one pointed to the second one. That's why the second one is built on greater promises because everything the first one was pointing to was fulfilled in totality in the second one because Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament story. It wasn't that the New Testament abolished the Old, it was that it fulfilled the Old and abolished certain ceremonies because it wasn't necessary anymore. And so... Jesus' answer to a strict legalistic Jew would have challenged them, but also could challenge some of us, as we see uh, in the story. So this guy, after Jesus said, do this and you will live, by the way, he was quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1, and also Leviticus 18, verse 5, which basically says, if a person does this, meaning the precepts of the law, they will live by them. I am the Lord. So he was quoting two verses when he gave his answer. Do this, meaning love God and love neighbor, and you will live. But this lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, Yeah, but who is my neighbor? And he didn't want it just so broad that he was obligated to help everybody. Because in rabbinic writings, and even uh, there's a second temple book called Syri Syriac, uh, where it talks about you're only obligated to help religious, righteous people. So he was trying to narrow who a neighbor was so he wouldn't be as obligated to help people that maybe weren't following the law or non-Jews. A lot of times we train, change the Bible around and we make it fit our narrative instead of fitting our life into the Bible's narrative. Yeah. Instead of saying, okay, I'm going to allow God to convict me mm -hmm. to do what the Word says, I'm changing the Word to make it conform to my mm -hmm. desires. Yeah. We pick and choose what scriptures we want to believe, what That's we want right. to obey. Uh, we make a scripture and say what we want it to say. Mm -hmm. We justify it. Yeah. We see this all the time. Even whole churches and denominations have changed the Bible around to fit the culture. Instead of challenging the culture, they're affirming it yep. by, by performing weddings with people who should be married, blah, 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 all these different things. So we have to understand that when God challenges us, are we going to conform to God or are we trying to make God like us? Mm, that's good. Are we trying to make God in our image or we're trying to conform our image based on God's image. Yeah. And that's the question we have to ask ourselves. And so we have to realize even the law of Moses included strangers in his definition of the neighbor. And sometimes what happened was they read the writings of the rabbis 
which some of them are crazy. Uh, even in the Talmud, there are teachings where, you know, they, non-Jews are like dogs, basically. And they can do whatever they want to them. But it, that's why you have to stick to the Bible instead mm -hmm. of just the writings yep. of people. Now, there are great commentaries we can read of men and women of God that will help us. I'm not saying we shouldn't read commentaries. But we need to say the commentary has to reflect scripture or I'm not going to listen to it. I can't put the writings of a rabbi or even a Christian thinker or teacher before the plain word of God. Does that make sense? Yep. So um, Jesus had no problem telling somebody the truth. And he could have quoted Leviticus 19.34 when it, it says, When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, meaning a non-Jew, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you the same as the native among you. So this would be like immigration and all that non-Jews coming into Israel. And you shall love him as yourself, for you also are strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So you see, loving someone as you love yourself was in the law that this lawyer should have known. But unfortunately, they read too many of the stories of, of the commentaries of the rabbis. Sometimes you could do that and not spend enough time in the Word and catch what the Word says. So, as I said, Jesus had no problem correcting this person. Instead of quoting Leviticus, he told him a story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. So, here we see Jesus is bringing out the story of a person who became a victim of a crime and suffered great loss and bodily harm due to nothing wrong on his part. It was because of his sin. This is important in the context of who was supposed to help. And so, a victim, not a perpetrator, uh, didn't do anything wrong. He was just the wrong place at the wrong time. And so, this frames the foundation of who God expects us to be a neighbor to. Meaning, he doesn't expect us to give money to every homeless person that comes and bail out, bail out every person who's in trouble, especially if their issues are due to self-inflicted wounds, especially if they are involved in financial mismanagement because of substance abuse, alcohol, drugs, gambling. This is not what being a good neighbor is in this story. Are you hearing this? Mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't say anything for nothing. This person brought, had not, he had, did nothing wrong. I mean, Jesus could have said somebody fell into sin, lost everything, and, you know, God had him come across somebody and he said, you know, you should bail that person out. Now, you could, and have mercy, even as the prodigal son lost everything, the father still brought him back. But in the context of someone we have no relationship with, and who we should be a neighbor to, I don't feel obligated to help every. I remember one time I gave one guy, homeless guy, 20 bucks. I said, let me experiment. let me see what he does. I gave him $20, immediately he ran. Didn't even say thank you, ran upstairs. What did he do? Probably went to get some more drugs. So uh, what I do is if someone wants money, is that I want money for food, I'll take it. And I'll shop mm -hmm. for you. I'll buy you food. I'll take you to the restaurant. Most of the time they say no. <laughs> Sometimes they would say, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, so you have to use wisdom in how you help people. But here, the point here is the framing of this story is you're not obligated just to help everybody. Uh, is that clear? Mm -hmm. Because if it's due to financial mismanagement, someone has a gambling problem, all that, all you're doing is you're feeding their drug addiction, their alcoholism, their irresponsibility. And sometimes you're bailing out somebody God allowed to be in a mess so that they can come to the end of their rope mm -hmm. and repent. And you're stopping them from repenting because you keep bailing them out. Hello? Does this make sense? Yes.
So that's where we have to have discernment. Even if in the church, you have people with a lot of sad stories. And you have to really discern who needs your help and who is the church obligated to help. As a matter of fact, in the church, and this may sound cruel, but you know, 1 Timothy 5, uh, <laughs> Jesus said, even the old women who are widows that are in the church, don't help them unless they have a history of being faithful by, by serving their family and helping the poor and helping others in the church. In other words, Paul is given a criteria of who to help even in the church. And so there's a criteria who the church is obligated to help. They have to be faithful. Now, of course, again, the churches have done many good things. They started the Red Cross and World Vision and we have food pantries, and even in Brooklyn, we're giving out food to hundreds and thousands of people every year. Uh, so we're not saying we don't help people, and we have to vet everybody. That would take forever, so, you know, it's on them. But in terms of who we're obligated to personally as a church, it's not a free-for-all. That's all the story is saying. And so Jesus said, okay, this guy's beaten up. He's on the floor, he's half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, when the priest saw the man half dead, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, who is in the tribe that could serve in the temple, so they were the only ones who could be priests, even though not all of them were priests. Levi came to the place, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, I often wondered, well, why in the world would you have to pass by on the other side? You just walk by him, right? Well, again, because of some of these rabbinic writings, they taught that somebody would contract uh, ritual impurity if they, if even the shadow of a dead person or if your shadow touched them. So that's why they crossed. And of course, it also says in the law, if you touch a dead person, you will be ritually impure for seven days. So they didn't, maybe they didn't know if this guy was dead or alive, and they passed by on the other side to make sure they avoided being impure uh, through the ritual of, of the law. And so the other thing is it says this guy was coming down which meant he was leaving Jerusalem. The priest and the Levite came down, meaning in their mind, they might have thought, I've already finished my religious duty. Because that's where they did everything in Jerusalem. A lot of the things they did religiously were in Jerusalem. So they might say, I did my religious duty. I don't have to help anybody else. Again, a legalistic way of looking at the law. Because Jerusalem was on several hills, about seven hills, and you had to go up to go there, come down when you're leaving. So again, nothing's an accident in the Bible. He came, they came down, meaning they finished their religious duty. And a lot of times we think, well, I went to church, I paid my tithes, I don't need to do anything else for God. I've, I've done my good deed for the day. Do you ever hear that? I've done my good deed for the day. There's no such thing as doing your good deed for the day. Imagine if God that attitude. I've done that good deal. I bailed your butt out five years ago. Uh, Joe had a great testimony. I, I bailed him out. Well, you're on your own now the rest of your life. Wow. I'm glad God's not like that with me. So what if you're supposed to do three good deeds? So you don't do the other two because you did one? I mean, so again, Jesus is trying to make sure we have his heart and basically, in spite of the fact of their religious beliefs, their religious beliefs dehumanize this man. Do you think God's word would ever dehumanize somebody? And because of their religion, they neglected someone's life and someone's soul. That fell short of the love of God, even in the Old Testament, not just the New Testament. Some Christians think, well, the Old Testament God was mean, and the New Testament God is a God of love. No, 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 no. <laughs> Nothing can be further from the truth. In some ways, 
The New Testament is even harder to follow than the Old Testament. You may not have to kill animals, and you may not have to get circumcised if you're a man, but Jesus said if you just lust after a woman, you've already committed adultery. That was not even in the Old Testament. <laughs> so Jesus said it's in the heart that God judges us. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, the standards are even higher through Jesus than it was in the law. That's right. But we see somebody came to the rescue. The priest walked on the other side. The Levite, Levite walked on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came to where he was. Wow. He saw him and he had compassion. I love this. A Samaritan. Samaritan stands for a non-Christian or someone outside of the covenant of God. God sees even what non-Christians do. doesn't mean they're going to go to heaven, but he sees what's happening. And so a deeper message, though, to this lawyer, to this religious Jew, was that this non-Jew showed the way of God more than a legalistic scripture saturated uh, guy who knew all the rabbinic writings and this non-Jew did what God wanted in one instant more than you've done in your life with all your studying. Wow. And another deep message which was probably the deepest is that Jews and Samaritans hated each other. The Samaritans only believed the first five books of the Bible were really God's word. They rejected everything after Deuteronomy. So the Psalms, the prophets, the wisdom books of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, they rejected all that. They rejected that you had to go to Jerusalem, to the temple. They said that you had to go to their mountain, Mount Gerizim, to worship. And Jesus brought that out when he was talking to the Samaritan woman who said, well, you say we should go here, but we say we should go there. Because they believed that they would go to a, a mountain called Gerizim for blessing. You see, see that in uh, Deuteronomy 27 where it was a mountain of cursing and a mountain of blessing. Mountain of cursing was, uh, blessing was Gerizim. So this Samaritan had historical animosity or supposed to have had historical animosity towards the Jews. Worse than not believing that the other books of the Bible were not of God, and perhaps as bad as saying you didn't need to go to Jerusalem to worship, was the fact that they were not totally Jews because the Assyrian king conquered Israel in around 738 AD, uh, BC, and put his own people in Samaria, which was the capital of Israel at that time. And then you had uh, Israel and Judah were divided after Solomon died. So the capital of the divided Israel was Samaria. And so the king of Assyria put his own priests in Samaria and his own people and they intermarried. So the Samaritans also were half-breeds. They were a hybrid. They weren't full Jews. So that Really, man, you're not a real Jew. So what was Jesus saying? Someone who wasn't a real Jew, who had a different interpretation of the law, who didn't even believe you had to go to Jerusalem, did more of God's will than you priests, you lawyers, you scribes, you Pharisees. Wow. Isn't that powerful? Man, Jesus really knew who to pick to tell a story. So Jesus is challenging not only their crazy legalistic interpretation of the law that didn't have the love of God, that misrepresented the God of the Old Testament, but Jesus challenged the notion of historical racism. He challenged the notion of historical grievance. What he's saying is no matter what historical grievance your ethnic people have, you need to forgive and move on and love people as you love yourself. No excuse for racism, no matter what historical grievances there were. 
And so, whatever, I mean, I was always taught when as a kid, they tried to pass it on to me, me and my friends didn't go for it, but the Irish and the Italians didn't like each other. Hey. And even when I was in Catholic <laughs> school, I, I, I tell you the truth, maybe it's my imagination, most of the nuns who, and the priests were Irish, they didn't like the Italians in the class. That was my experience. But we got along, man. My best friends were Irish. I mean, so thank God we didn't allow that to happen. But historically, we see some of that. And then, you know, blacks and whites and the whole thing there. Uh, and then even amongst Hispanics, you have Dominicans don't like the Puerto Ricans, they don't like the Mexicans, they don't like this, and, don't like, and you know, it's just stupid. God is telling us, in spite of our historical narratives, in spite of what was passed down to us by our parents, or by our culture, or by our neighborhood, God expects you to treat everyone as a human, made in His image. And you are responsible, irrespective of their lifestyle or their religion, to look at them as a human. Even if you don't agree with their lifestyle, the way they look, the way they dress, their sexuality, whatever you think you don't like about who they voted. You might have voted Democratic to see someone walking around with a MAGA hat. You still have to love them. Mm -hmm. And if they're in need, you help them. Mm -hmm. I heard a funny story about a guy who uh, almost got into a fight with a truck driver. And he got into his car and he put on a MAGA hat. And the truck driver gave him a hug. <laughs> that might have been in a movie someone told me about. But uh, the point is... MAGA hat is more important than the Jesus hat. We need to love people because they're made in God's image. Case closed. Whether they're gay, straight, black, white, whether you have bad experiences with, with uh, certain kinds of people, whatever. Um, we need to understand that in God's eyes is no excuse for not loving people. So everybody's a human. So what did the Samaritan do? He went to him and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Wine, you have alcohol, which is a disinfectant. Oil was also used as a medicinal, so it's like he gave him medicine. Then he said he put him on his own animal, most likely a donkey. Now listen to this. According to the culture of that time, putting a person on your animal and bringing them somewhere was a sign of being their servant or slave. The Samaritan, even with hatred in their history, became the slave of the wounded man who couldn't do anything for him, who happened to be a Jew. Isn't that powerful? Let him on his own donkey as if he was the guy's servant and the guy in the donkey was his master. Jesus said, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, when Jesus is talking about being a servant or a slave, he's not talking about chattel slavery like we had in American history where we owned a slave, that's not what he's talking about. It has to do with being a volunteer to serve and love. Uh, and now, what did he do with this man? He brought him to an inn. It would be like a hotel or a motel. And he took care of him. And the next day, he took out money, and he gave them to the innkeeper. And he said, take care of him. So he gave money to the guy at the front desk. Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. This illustrates the fact that in this particular story, you couldn't be a good Samaritan unless you had wealth, unless you had money. Jesus is also saying here in a hidden meaning, nothing wrong with having a lot of money, or nothing wrong with having enough money so that you can care for people. Sometimes Christians think about poverty and think it's wrong to generate income, generate wealth. Well, you give me your money, then. I know what to do with it. Uh, I think God wants us to create wealth. I think that's 
That's the only way we could be a good Samaritan. There's no way this guy could have paid for someone's stay as long as he had to stay to have his own donkey. That was very expensive to have a, a oil and wine and all these resources so that the guy said, when I come back, I'll pay you anything that you've spent out of your pocket. Do whatever you need to do to get this man healthy. Mm -hmm. Well, how can a poor person do this? I mean, it's possible to a point. You can bring them in your house, share whatever you have. But to do what this guy did in the context of what it costs to have a donkey and have money to pay for someone in a hotel, mm -hmm. that, that guy had a lot more than what he needed for himself. And I believe the main purpose of wealth creation is to be a blessing to humanity, to share the gospel, to be a witness of Christ. It says in Deuteronomy 8.18, God has given us power to create wealth. Why? So we just have a nice house? No. He has given us power to create wealth so that he, meaning God, can confirm his covenant in the earth. The more money the church has, the more the gospel can go forth. That's why it's a blessing to give tithes and offerings and raise up entrepreneurs and investors and raise up people in the marketplace, just the church space. And so then Jesus said to him, which of these three, he's talking to the lawyer, meaning the, Samar uh, the uh, priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, he's po posing the question, which of these three proved to be a neighbor or obeyed the law? of loving God, loving people, proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers. And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So it wasn't just a historical story. The story meant to obligate the lawyer and continues to obligate us, even though it's more than 2,000 years later. God never tells us a story without obligating us. There's a reason why it's in the Bible, because he expects us to be a neighbor to those that we meet. The conclusion of the story, how do we apply this to our own life? Can we identify right now, if we know somebody who's in need, who's a neighbor? A neighbor implies somebody in your sphere of influence, in proximity to you. It could be someone on your job. It could be maybe it's not money they need. Maybe they just need counseling. Maybe they need love. Maybe they need prayer. Maybe they just need a friend. Maybe they're lonely. Maybe they're depressed. Whatever. Can we identify somebody in our circle of influence who needs us? Do we see the connection between loving God and loving our neighbor? as shown in the law of Moses. How effective do you think the church would be if each Christ follower not only preached the gospel, but showed mercy and love to others? Imagine if we all did that. And what would it take for us to be good Samaritans? What would it take for the church to be a good Samaritan? We thank God that in Brooklyn we have children of the city and we've done a lot to serve the community here. We have a lot of us banding together to do things, Christmas, sending out presents and other things that we do. What can we do more? And what can we do as individuals? What can we even do as business leaders and business owners? There's many different ways to apply this. But most importantly, are we applying the story to ourselves, or are we justifying ourselves and saying this is for somebody else, not for me? So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, that there's no accidents. Everything you give us is for a reason. Because the Word of God is holistic, it's balanced, it deals not only with individual sin and salvation, but also deals with our obligation to our neighbor. So, Father, we pray that you'd help us to put this story into practice. 
In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, why don't we all stand for worship? And if there's anybody who needs prayer, our leaders will be coming up here to pray and minister. Anyone who needs ministry. Good morning, sir.